I'm Susan Murphy. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, the search continues for 12 missing Marines following a helicopter collision in Hawaii. Meantime, sailors in San Diego are breathing a sigh of relief after finishing a complicated hull swap that will allow them to stay home ported in America's finest city. And environmentalists are backing new legislation that would prevent future leaks like the one pouring methane into an L.A. suburb. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Rescuers continue to search tonight for crew members of two Marine Corps helicopters that collided and went down off the island of Oahu last night. Officials say the transport helicopters crashed during a training mission. Twelve Hawaii-based Marines are missing. The helicopters are known as Super Stallions, the U.S. military's largest helicopter capable of carrying a light armored vehicle, 16 tons of cargo, or a team of combat-equipped Marines. Marines. Defense Secretary Ash Carter says it appears a navigational error sent the crews of two Navy boats into Iranian waters earlier this week. Ten San Diego-based sailors were detained overnight by Iran before being released. The Navy says it plans to investigate. More parks, more libraries, and better roads. Those were just a few of the goals laid out by Mayor Kevin Faulkner in his State of the City address last night. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen has the highlights. Well, Faulkner's speech was a mix of touting past accomplishments and laying out plans for the future. He championed his climate action plan, which made San Diego the biggest city in the country to commit to 100 percent renewable energy. And he said the city was on its way to repairing 1,000 miles of streets in five years. One accomplishment he hasn't yet achieved, expanding the convention center. He mentioned that goal in his speech last year, but the plan has been held up by a lawsuit. Here's more of what he had to say. I will continue to stand up for San Diego's jobs and neighborhoods by fighting this in court. And we will put a legally defensible plan on the ballot to finance this project. It's time to settle this once and for all and get the convention center expanded. Now, Faulkner didn't give any specifics on what that ballot measure would look like, but it's likely to include a tax increase. After the speech, Councilman Todd Gloria said the city has better things to spend money on. Um, I think that if we're going to ask people for more money out of their pockets, I think it should, the priority ought to be on rebuilding neighborhoods, uh, not necessarily on expanding the convention center first. On that issue of rebuilding neighborhoods, Faulkner officially endorsed a plan to create a special fund for infrastructure. That plan would go before voters in June. It doesn't include a tax increase. And it's not clear how much of a dent the plan would make in San Diego's infrastructure deficit, which the city estimates at more than a billion dollars. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Potholes are just one of the city's infrastructure concerns. San Diego City crews have been working to patch up hundreds of potholes after last week's heavy rains. The biggest problem areas are on streets that flooded, including in Mission Valley. Last week, there were more than 500 storm-related calls, including reports of road damage. The city says crews are doing more than just patching the holes. Well, we've got a new process where we're doing minor asphalt repair versus just filling potholes. And uh, basically that involves looking at a greater area to, to fill cracks that might be uh, leading to causing the potholes in the future. The city's street division grinds and repairs an average of 30,000 potholes each year. The crews go neighborhood by neighborhood and focus their attention on one city council district each day. People are encouraged to report potholes on the city's website, sandiego.gov, or by calling the pothole hotline at 619-527-7500. Also in his address, the mayor announced the Housing Our Heroes initiative. It calls on landlords to rent to homeless veterans. KPBS reporter Megan Burks says those working on the problem believe it could be the missing piece of the puzzle. 
In 2014, San Diego pledged to end chronic veteran homelessness by 2016. Well, it's 2016, and people working on the effort say San Diego is this close if landlords step up. They say there's enough in rental subsidies to house nearly all of the veterans on San Diego streets, but not enough landlords willing to rent to them. That's really where we've been falling short due to our tight rental markets and the lack of a high-level coordinated effort to recruit landlords for the effort. We know from other cities across the country that when you do make the ask, landlords and property managers do step up to help end better homelessness. We can assess, we can identify, we can figure out what the needs are of the people that are on the street, but if we have no place to put them, we can't end homelessness. According to advocates, there are currently 300 individuals with Section 8 rental vouchers who remain on the streets because they have nowhere to use them. The mayor's initiative would harness available federal funds and partnerships with the Chamber of Commerce and San Diego Apartment Association to find landlords willing to help. He's also asking city council for $4 million for the effort. Typically, tenants getting housing assistance like Section 8 pay a portion of the rent that they can afford, and the government picks up the rest. Megan Burks, KPBS News. Mayor Faulkner had his first phone call with Chargers owner Dean Spano since this week's NFL meeting, rejecting the team's bid to move to Carson. It was just five minutes, and the spokesman for the mayor said he asked for a face-to-face -face meeting. Spanos is still reviewing his options. His spokesman says the talk was cordial, and so was a call with County Supervisor Ron Roberts. Spanos has a year to decide whether to work out a deal with the city or to partner with Rams owner Stan Kroenke on a new stadium in Inglewood. Kroenke got a hero's welcome in Inglewood today at a rally by excited fans. He told them, quote, we're going to have some fun. And he said he'd bring some Super Bowls to his planned stadium, which is scheduled to be ready for the 2019 season. He also said he was so confident with his project that it would win that eight months ago, he offered it as the site of the 2020 Super Bowl. A new rule will let doctors make the call about letting college athletes return to play after they're injured. The NCAA already requires schools to have concussion protocols, but officials say this new rule sets up a strong wall between medical professionals and coaches, so athletes aren't pressured to get back in the game too soon. The rule specifically applies to major college conferences. Schools and other conferences like San Diego State are strongly encouraged to follow suit. A new report looking at the first year of Obamacare ranks California number one on gains in health coverage for Hispanic children. From our North County Bureau, KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg says the report comes from Georgetown University Center for Children and Families. The report says between 2013 and 2014, California extended coverage to 132,000 more Hispanic kids. That gain was due primarily to the state's decision to make it easier for families to qualify for Medi-Cal. Fatima Morales is with the nonprofit advocacy group Children Now. She says a large number of Hispanic kids are still uninsured. There's still about 323,000 uninsured kids in our state, you know, and many of these children do currently qualify for Medi-Cal but are unenrolled. On May 1st, California will offer Medi-Cal to some 170,000 children of parents who are here illegally. Kenny Goldberg, KPBS News. The leader of the Episcopal Church in the U.S. says it will not roll back its acceptance of same-sex marriage despite sanctions imposed this week by Anglican leaders. Those sanctions exclude the U.S. Church from taking part in decisions about doctrine or operations for three years. Here in San Diego, Bishop James Mathis told parishioners the Episcopal Church is making an important and painful witness to the Anglican communion about human sexuality. Church leaders have been trying to avoid a split that's been building over issues such as homosexuality and the role of women in the church. It took more than five months, but the last crew members from the Navy's historic three-carrier swap are flying home from Virginia to San Diego. KPBS's Steve Walsh has this report. The Navy had never tried this. Swapping three Nimitz-class carriers while allowing their crews to keep their home ports. The Ronald Reagan, the George Washington, and the Theodore Roosevelt swapped positions, 
while their families didn't have to. Roughly 1,400 crew members served aboard all three ships beginning in August. Asked if they'd like to try that again, Command Master Sergeant Spike Call said no. But the reason why I say no to that is because this is hard, like it's really hard. To do one, to, to do one hull swap is, is not easy uh, in the fact that, again, we're talking about people and feelings and emotions and, and all of that. Um, did we do it successfully? Yeah, uh, but this ain't easy work. Call said it was tough on the crews who were constantly swapping shipmates. The plan was to save the Navy $41 million in relocation costs while making life easier on the families. They wouldn't have to trade San Diego for Norfolk, Virginia, or Japan. And now that it's over, families do seem to be happy that they're staying. Uh, I've been out here for now for about five years, and we've settled here. We have a lot of friends, a lot of um, family out here, and it's, this is home. Roosevelt is now ported in San Diego. It arrived in November from a nine-month around-the-world deployment. It's receiving repairs and is expected to stay close to port at least through the next six months. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. A wounded vet who just got his dream home will now have to deal with the theft of his vehicle. Nick Kimmel lost both legs and an arm in Afghanistan. Just last week, he got a new home in Fallbrook, adapted to his needs. But his ATV was stolen from his apartment complex in Mission Valley before it could be moved. Well, I was excited to get it to my new house because I have two and a half acres, so I could use it to drive around. And then I have, I'm putting in a little archery range on my property, and then my mailbox is 1,000 feet away down at Incline, and so I was going to use it for stuff like that, and now I can't. The ATV and its trailer were modified for Kimmel's use. They were last seen Friday by the maintenance people at his gated apartment complex off Friars Road near Qualcomm Stadium. Well, it's Friday, and they're still here, but for how long? city tagged a sinkhole in emergency it became a disaster jerry brown wants a safe somewhat conservative budget we all want a viable city so how are we doing join us tonight at 8 30 for the kpbs roundtable a new program is training police and civilians to work together in combating an active shooter on a college campus kpbs education reporter matt bowler says they're preparing for the worst This is only a drill, but it's a scary one. In the beginning, everybody's shocked. You know, we're, sh we're showing you how dangerous and all the statistics of all the casualties and everything. And we show them why there's so many casualties. And then we show them how to change that. Richard Farrell's training police officers and civilians to fight an active shooter. The Community College Police Department has been training for such a scenario for seven years, but the program to train the regular district employee is new. It's called ALICE, standing for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, and Evacuate. Employees are being taught to fight back against attackers, and for the first time, officers and employees are training together. Both parties get to learn how they're going to in interact during an active killing situation. Rosalind Cruz works in City College's Child Development Center. She says even though the training was only pretend, it drove home a lot of fear. Once he heard like the gunshots going off, the bombs, it was just like, he felt like this adrenaline, like, oh my God, what am I going to do? My kids, my husband, what am I doing? How do I get safe to them? Farrell says would-be attackers want to victimize the most vulnerable. They're hate harvesters. They've, they've, they've bundled up all the wrongs in their lives and they go out and use violence. To, they're looking for targets that are helpless, that aren't going to resist. But with the proper training, soft targets, like Children's Center employees, can be trained to thwart an attack. Okay, what am I going to do if somebody walks in here? How am I going to help protect, you know, the children that are here? How am I going to get home to my family? What do I need to do to do that? Matt Bowler, KPBS News. Environmental advocates are backing new legislation meant to prevent future gas leaks, like the massive one near Los Angeles. The bill would require safety valves on these wells, better leak protection, and stronger regulations. Some of these, these 
wells are, you know, from pre-1953. They're over 60 years old. Um, they haven't been inspected on a, regu uh, on a routine enough basis. Um, that would be uh, fixed through some of this legislation. The legislation also would require the gas company to pay for the relocation of thousands of residents affected and environmental costs of the leak rather than passing the costs off to ratepayers. The bill will be considered next week at the Capitol. San Diego County's water agencies could get a break on how much they have to conserve to meet the sta state's mandated water use cutbacks. Thanks to the new desalination plant in Carlsbad, some new draft rules proposed by the state would give San Diego credit for that plant. And our regional target for water conservation could drop from 20 to 12 percent. San Diego is expected to get hit with some heavy surf this weekend. There's an advisory in effect from Sunday through Tuesday. Forecasters are predicting waves from 7 to 14 feet high. Those can create dangerous swimming conditions and strong rip currents. Here's Molly Cochran with what else we can expect in this week's weather. Well, the state of California currently catching a break in the action before the next round of some unsettled weather set to move in for the upcoming weekend. And that's going to once again impact San Francisco and farther off to the north. So the jet stream still in place here, really helping to drag any of those areas of low pressure right on into the northern half of the state. The exception being Southern California. We are expecting very nice weather for the remainder of tonight and also into the upcoming weekend. So we do have the Carlsbad Half Marathon and Marathon coming up on Sunday. Sunday, and it looks to be very nice for that. We'll be under clear skies for the remainder of tonight. Over the next, or over the last six hours, rather, other than a few clouds out there, really it's been quiet and generally pretty nice. So temperatures tonight, again, going to be coming in pretty close to where we should be for this time of year in the upper 40s to uh, lower 50s in some locations. A little bit cooler in the mountainous regions, right around 42 tonight in Borrego Springs, and also hitting 30 in Mount Laguna. So we'll need the heavy coats here. Here's a closer look at as we uh, take a peek at the first half of the weekend, Again, we can just watch the showers coming into the northern half of the state, even getting into San Francisco. So any getaway plans here could potentially be looking at some travel delays and flight delays due to the low cloud ceilings and also the chance for some showers. But the wet weather and the snow, definitely a good thing for the California drought. But we will stay dry and sunny uh, from L.A. into San Diego County. Here's a look at the immediate coastline. Partly sunny skies coming up on Sunday. Temperature right around 66 degrees, a few degrees above average for this time of year. We'll have periods of sun on Monday and then look what's coming on Tuesday. A little rain going to be advancing in. We'll watch that jet stream uh, push farther off to the south. So some wet weather going to be advancing into San Diego County and also we'll be looking at some cloud cover. Quick to dry up though by the time we head into the middle half of the week. Farther inland, partial sunshine for Sunday with a daytime high of 67. Also coming up in San Diego County is restaurant week and that's going to be kicking off on Sunday. Partly sunny skies for Monday. Also the chance for some showers as we head into Tuesday. Pretty similar setup across the mountainous regions, but our temperatures will be a little bit cooler. We're in the 50s during the daytime and our overnight lows generally staying in the 30s. Desert region for Sunday, temperatures in the 70s. Pretty nice afternoon coming up with partly sunny skies. Also going to be watching that increase in cloud cover and some showers advance in by the time we head into Tuesday. Molly Cochran, KPBS News. National outcry over a legal battle forcing Yosemite National Park to change the names of some of its iconic landmarks. Places like the Awani Hotel and Curry Village will be renamed the Majestic Yosemite Hotel and Half Dome Village. The company Delaware North sued the park for $54 million for rights to the names. The company used to run the park's concessions, but its contract was not renewed. We think it's crazy. It's disgusting. It's another example of a, of a big corporation trying to own what is sort of in, in the public realm. National Park officials say they will have to change several names to be able to continue to offer concession services to visitors. 
Walmart is closing 269 of its stores in the U.S. and Latin America. Nine of those are in California, but none of the San Diego locations will be shut down. Most of the affected stores are small format stores called Walmart Express. The company has been facing increased competition, including from online rival Amazon. The closures will affect 16,000 workers. All Chipotle restaurants will be closing next month, but only for a few hours. The Denver-based chain says on February 8th, stores will open four hours late so it can hold company-wide food safety meetings. Following a series of food scares, the chain sales have tanked since outbreaks of E. coli in late October and norovirus in December. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour, a look at the failing efforts to diversify the high tech workforce. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. How much energy do we lose between the power plant and the plug in your home? It's a complicated question, but Inside Energy's Jordan Wirfs Brock tries to find out. IE questions, your energy questions, answered. The amount of energy that is wasted in the production of electricity. This is Jim Barlow. He's an architect from Wyoming. I've asked this question to other people and nobody's had an answer. Well, Jim, let's find out. As electricity goes from a power plant to the plug in your home, how much is lost? Let's break it out, step by step. Consider this lump of coal. Stick it in a power plant and only a third of its energy makes it onto the grid as electricity. That's physics for you. Next, that electricity travels on big, long distance, high voltage power lines, sometimes hundreds of miles cross country. We call this transmission. As electricity flows through wires, it heats them up. And we lose 2% of the energy just warming the air. Then distribution, where electricity flows through your neighborhood on smaller, lower voltage power lines. Transformers, those are the cans on power poles, step it down to a voltage that's safe for your home. In that last mile or so, we lose about 4% of the energy in our electricity. So by the time it reaches your house, five or six percent of electricity has literally flown away as heat. But in rural states where people are spread out, like Wyoming, we lose way less. Here's why. Those high voltage cross country transmission lines lose less energy than the low voltage neighborhood distribution lines. Think of it as the bigger the power line, the smaller the losses. Another cool thing, you can actually see losses. Notice how power lines sag in the middle? Some is gravity. But the rest? Heat, like the kind lost from electricity, makes metal power lines expand. And when they do, they sag. Power lines are saggier on hot days. And they leak more energy. After that, electricity enters your house. It travels on wiring inside your walls to its final destination. Your plug. Utility companies meticulously measure losses from the power plant to your meter. But once electricity enters your home, we stop measuring. To find out how much is lost, we'd have to put a meter on all of your appliances. So to recap, in power plants, nuclear, natural gas, coal, petroleum, we lose about 65% of the energy in raw materials when we make electricity. That adds up to 22 quadrillion BTU a year in the US. That's more than our annual gasoline consumption, lost to thermodynamics. When we move electricity from a plant to your home, we lose another 5 to 6%. That's 69 trillion BTU, or roughly the same amount of energy Americans use drying our clothes every year. And inside your home, it's a mystery. Losses fluctuate all the time. The physics of the grid tells us losses increase with temperature, current, and demand. Which means if everyone turns on their lights and AC and TVs all at the same time, losses are big. But even out that electricity use, and losses are smaller. The same applies to your house, which is basically your own personal grid. You can reduce losses in your home by spreading out your electricity use instead of running all your appliances at once. So, what does Jim in Wyoming think of this? He thinks we can put this knowledge to use. How do we, you know, reduce our overall carbon footprint with this knowledge? What's your energy question? Submit it at ask.insideenergy.org. 
Recapping tonight's top stories, rescuers continue to search tonight for crew members of two Marine Corps helicopters that collided and went down off the island of Oahu last night. Officials say the transport helicopters crashed during a training mission. Twelve Hawaii-based Marines are missing. San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner has had his first phone call with Chargers owner Dean Spanos since this week's NFL meeting rejecting the team's bid to move to Carson. It was just five minutes and a spokesman for the mayor says he, he has asked for a face-to-face -face meeting. Spanos is still reviewing his options, work out a deal with the city or to partner with Rams owner Stan Kroenke on a new stadium in Inglewood. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend.